loving and gracious God, we open our minds, our hearts as best we know how to the understanding of this important story that was just read. And may we hear in it and through it your word of grace for us. Such a powerful song that we just heard, forgiveness, that you intend for every person to know. And maybe somebody listening today really does need to know that, that you are a forgiving God. Speak to us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, inevitably, anytime you talk about forgiveness, uh, somebody raises the question, but how do I forgive myself? And the first week we started this series, uh, somebody came to me in between the services and said what I've heard people say tons of times throughout my ministry. I believe uh, that we should forgive other people. Uh, it's not always easy, but I try to do it the best I can. When I do it, I feel like I'm a better human being, but my problem is my guilt. What I've done wrong in my life, how do I forgive myself? A few days after that, I got an email from another member of the church. He was thinking about uh, a statement I shared that Eva Kaur said, that forgiveness is not forgetting. He said, I have found it, uh, no, yes, I have found it most difficult to forgive myself for past deeds. I've tried very hard to forgive others and am succeeding, but the struggle of forgiving myself is a heavy chore. And you know it is a heavy chore. It is a very heavy chore to forgive ourselves, especially if you come out of a religious environment where a lot of emphasis was placed on guilt in the process of forgiveness. I mean, I believe people come into church every week just weighed down with guilt and shame because what they've been led to believe is that your experiencing forgiveness depends to a certain degree on how sorry you are for what you've done. Just think about Martin Luther. Before he became the leader of the Reformation, he was a monk consumed with guilt. He couldn't do enough to set himself free. He'd go to confessional for hours, made sure that he did every penance, to be forgiven until one day the light broke through and he realized he was allowing his forgiveness to be dependent on his own merits. This is what causes some people to disregard religion altogether. Sigmund Freud, in his psychoanalytical work, observed the amount of guilt and shame in society around him and he said that it plagues so many because it's just a fabrication of a religious system imposed on people. Get rid of the system and you set free the soul. Well, that's interesting when you consider a recent study done in the German population that found over a quarter of people reported having intense feelings of guilt that contributed to high levels of depression. So religion might contribute to the problem of guilt, but getting rid of religion doesn't seem to be the answer either. So religious or not religious, a lot of people identify that they're very eager to have some experience where they feel forgiven for wrongs in their lives. And that's what makes the apostle Simon Peter very appealing in the story that we're looking at today that we heard read a moment ago. Jesus had been teaching by the Sea of Galilee and so many people came to hear him that he stepped into Peter's boat. Now, Peter had been fishing all night. He didn't catch anything. He was washing out his nets. So Jesus asked to push the boat out a little from shore so that everybody there could see and hear him better. Now, if you read this story by itself, it's easy to think that this is the first time that Jesus met Peter, which would seem kind of odd that he would be comfortable stepping in the boat of somebody he didn't even know, where in fact he did. If you read the chapters before this in the Gospel of Luke, you learn that Jesus has already been a guest in Simon Peter's house. Peter has heard Jesus teach in the synagogue and he's witnessed Jesus perform a miracle, the healing of his mother-in-law. So chances are that Peter had a certain admiration for Jesus. But what happened that day turned his admiration into fear. 
when Jesus finished teaching, he looked at Peter and said, why don't you throw your nets out on the other side of the boat? Now, Peter's been washing his nets. What's he going to do if he does that? He's going to have to do the same work all over again. And he already has not succeeded after fishing all night. But he admires Jesus. So he says, because you say so, I will let down my nets. And when he pulls the net back up, it is so full of fish, the net is about to break. So another boat comes over to help. And all of the fishermen are loading up both boats with so many fish, both boats start to sink. The Renaissance painter Raphael painted a picture of this story. And this picture, I think, does a great job of catch, capturing the chaos of the moment. You see these fishermen scurrying around, you know, trying to get as many of these fish as they can, trying to keep the boats from sinking. But when you really look at it for a moment and then you start to zero in on Peter, you realize something different is going on with Peter. He's not caught up in the chaos. He's thinking about something else. And he's kneeling before Jesus. And he is saying, depart from me, Lord. For I am a sinful man. Now, what do you make of that? A great preacher of a century ago, Harry Emerson Fosdick, preached a sermon on this passage. He called, Taking Jesus Seriously. He said, a lot of people in society admire Jesus. They admire his teachings. They admire his compassion. They even admire his courage. But their discipleship doesn't go much beyond admiration. But for Peter in this story, something more is happening because Peter knows he is not in the presence of just some great leader, uh, some great philosopher, that his, his power, his authority is not of this world. And realizing who he is before makes him shrink back. It makes him feel a sense of his own unworthiness. And all he can think to say is, get away from me. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. Fosdick says, that is taking Jesus seriously. There was a belief in the ancient world that you could not be in God's presence and live. God is holy. We are not. So no wonder Moses was scared to death to be in God's presence on Mount Sinai. No wonder the prophet Isaiah in God's presence could only say, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. No wonder Peter would say, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. I believe Peter becomes more appealing to us in this story than he ever was when he got out of the boat and walked on water. Because this Peter we can relate to. This Peter we can understand. Because we all might have some idea of what it's like to feel in the presence of God and at the same time have a sense of our own unworthiness that somehow I, I don't belong here. God, I've got some stuff in my life I know is unacceptable in your presence. I, I can't imagine that you can really forgive me for things I have done. But Jesus never leaves a person the way he finds them. He does not leave Peter wallowing in his sin. And so if you have ever struggled with guilt, if you struggle with it right now, then it's worth looking closer at this story to see what it is that Jesus did for Peter. So consider one thing about this story. Think, first of all, that Jesus' power is displayed at Peter's point of failure. His power shows up because Peter had failed. If Peter had not failed fishing all night, he would have never experienced a miracle. And it says something about our spiritual lives that it's in our recognition of failure, of inadequacy, 
that we experience grace. For the sake of argument, let's imagine that Peter didn't fail fishing that night. Let's say he actually had a good night. He caught an average load of fish. And then Jesus said, now I want you to throw your net out again after he's cleaned it. Now, what would you think Peter would say? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. I caught some fish. I've already cleaned my nets. I'm satisfied. The greatest threat to the power of the gospel is not people bent on doing evil. It's people who say, I'm satisfied. No need. When we can recognize need, when we can admit sin, we become our most inviting to Jesus. Within just a few verses of this story in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus would say, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. I didn't come to invite good people to turn to God. I came to invite sinners. Mother Teresa once said, the purpose of guilt is to bring us to the Lord. After that, it has no purpose. The next time your conscience is racked by guilt, try praying this prayer. Lord, I thank you for these feelings because they cause me to turn to you and you are the only one who knows the truth about me. Another observation about this story. Peter obeys Jesus though he benefits the doubts of it. He obeys Jesus even though he doubts that it's going to have any benefit. He has failed fishing. Jesus says, throw your nets out again. He doesn't think it's going to do any good. His heart isn't in it. But he says, because you say so, I'll throw it out. The same is true when it comes to forgiveness. Sometimes people say, I believe God forgives me. I just don't feel forgiven. How do I forgive myself? And the truth is, the answer is you can't. And (laughs) you probably shouldn't. Because it's way too easy to allow forgiving ourselves to become excusing ourselves. Lewis Smedes, in his famous book, The Art of Forgiving, questions the morality of self-forgiveness. He writes, what right do I have to hurt someone and then conveniently forgive myself for doing them wrong? He goes on, if a drunk driver ran over one of my grandchildren and told me a few days later that he had forgiven himself for what he did, I think I'd wring his neck. Let's face it, forgiving ourselves is a questionable operation we are all too prone to excuse ourselves anyway and forgiving ourselves could be a cheap trick to avoid responsibility but wallowing in guilt and beating ourselves up day after day for the same sin is not God's desire either. And that takes us back to Peter throwing out the net. He did it even though he didn't feel that it was going to produce any benefit. We accept forgiveness even when we don't feel it. Sometimes we do, sometimes. Sometimes you have that feeling in your heart of being set free, that God doesn't find you guilty, that you're liberated, just like I'm, I'm born all over again. It's wonderful. But the human conscience is fickle. We will have moments where we get haunted all over again, where we will be told, now you know you really weren't forgiven, don't you? You know that God did not forgive you. If you were really forgiven, you wouldn't even feel the way you feel right now. And the conscience takes over. But if we... If we base our forgiveness on 
own feeling, we limit the truth and the power of the cross because our feelings can go up and down. This is what the writer of 1 John Menon saying. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. In Tim Keller's book, Forgive, he tells a story about John Newton, the famous slave ship captain who converted to Christ, became a minister in the Anglican church and wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. Well, he was in correspondence with a young man who was racked by guilt. He just kept emphasizing, I'm so sinful, I'm such a shame. And, and so uh, Newton wrote this letter to him to warn him about wallowing in guilt. He said, you express not only a low opinion of yourself, which is right. <laughs> Don't you love that? You express a low opinion and you probably should but too low an opinion of the person, work, and promises of the Redeemer, which is certainly wrong. Satan sometimes offers to teach us humility, but though I wish to be humble, I desire not to learn in his school. His premises about our sinfulness are perhaps true, but then he draws admirable conclusions from them and would teach us that therefore we ought to question either the power or the willingness or the faithfulness of Christ. Indeed, Though our self-incriminations are good so far as they show a dislike of sin, yet when we come to examine them closely, there is often so much self-will, self-righteousness, unbelief, pride, and impatience mingled with them that they are little better than the worst evils we complain of. When we go on and on about our inability to forgive ourselves, at some point, it not only questions the efficacy of the cross, it attacks it. But one more thing to pay attention to in this story, and it may be the most important, because it doesn't just reveal how we experience forgiveness, it reveals why God forgives us. Notice that Jesus seems more concerned about our purpose for living than just our peace of mind. Jesus never says in this story that Peter was forgiven. That omission stands out because Peter has recognized that his sinfulness is what's getting between him and Jesus. But instead of saying to Peter, You're forgiven. He says, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. Jesus gives him a job. Jesus wasn't concerned with just giving Peter a clean conscience so he could go on living his life and just have a little freer spirit. Jesus has a mission for Peter, just like he has a mission for you and for me, and the greatest confirmation of our forgiveness is that in spite of our background checks, Jesus is willing to hire us. He employs us. Biblical scholar Edward Schweitzer says, sin is overcome through service. Now, he doesn't mean by that that we have to earn God's approval. What he means is that we experience the approval we already have when we serve this is the way we feel forgiven this is the way we experience grace by responding to Jesus who says try once more let me give you another chance and when we're genuinely repentant doing what Jesus calls us to do is how we experience grace There's a story that comes at the end of the Gospel of John that sounds almost identical to this one in Luke. The resurrection has taken place, but Peter can't get beyond his own guilt for denying Jesus three times. So he goes back to Galilee to go fishing. 
he fishes all night and he doesn't catch anything. Jesus appears on the beach, but they don't recognize him. He says, throw your nets out on the other side. So they do. And once again, they bring up a haul of fish. And this is when Peter recognizes that this is Jesus. And he jumps in the water and he swims to shore. Jesus has made a charcoal fire, the Gospel of John says, and he's cooking fish to eat for breakfast. Now, what's important about a charcoal fire? When was the last time Peter stood by a charcoal fire? It was standing in the courtyard of the temple where he denied Jesus. And Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? And it feels like Jesus is taking him back to his denial as if he's just grinding an ax of guilt into his heart. But that's not what he's doing. Three times he says to Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. In other words, you are still employable to me. You are still a valued employee. I want to use you. I want to give you a job. I want to put you to work. And it's when we feel like, wait, God, you want to use someone like me? Really? That's when we experience forgiveness. In the early days of the IBM Corporation, there was a story about an aggressive but promising junior executive who got caught up in a risky venture and he lost $10 million. The founder and CEO of IBM, Tom Watson Jr., called for the executive to appear in his office. The young man was just like shaking. He, he couldn't stand it. He just blurted out, I know you called me in here for my resignation. Here it is, I resign. Tom Watson Jr. said, are you kidding? I just invested $10 million in your education. I can't afford your resignation. <laughs> I believe a conversation like that went on between Jesus and Peter. Quit? Go back to fishing? Are you kidding me? I just invested my blood, sweat, and tears in you. I just died on a cross for you. I need you in the game. I need you to show my love and forgiveness and the news that there's a God who gives second chances to people. I need you to love people. And when we serve Jesus... It will always mean that no matter the job we do, it involves loving people and showing grace. And if we haven't found grace, we don't have much to share. If we don't have grace in our lives, all we've got to share is, I've got to earn my approval. I've got to do enough good things in my life that maybe God will love me. And what it means is what we've got to share is that you better too. And I bet you don't measure up. I bet you haven't done a good enough job. I bet you need to do a lot more than you're doing. And our world's got way too much of that already. We need a gospel that liberates people from the power of their own self-will and their own goodness to know that our goodness comes from God and that we are forgiven and he wants to renew us and to use us. Do you need to remember that today? Do you need to know that today? Have you known it but forgotten it? Have you known it up here, but it's not down here? I invite you just to close your eyes right now and maybe just open your hands up as we close in prayer. And as I pray, I invite you to use these words to just pray them to yourself and let them be your prayer this morning. Lord, I only hurt myself and probably others when I don't trust in your grace. When I am tempted to self-righteously believe that my sin is worse than others, that my sin is too great. 
Lord, move all the self-importance out of the way and give me a conviction about my own forgiveness that doesn't depend on feelings so I can get on with the task you have for me, showing your grace and love to others. I pray this in the name of him who is all grace and mercy, Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. And all God's people said, amen.